Hi everyone, welcome to this latest episode of VFX Futures. I'm your host Ian Fales from beforesandafters.com and today we're going to be talking about the future of virtual reality art with Kevin Mack. Hi Kevin, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm great Kevin, whereabouts are you in the world at the moment? Uh, I'm in Los Angeles, uh, kind of near Santa Monica, west, west side of Los Angeles. Uh, I really miss going over there. I'm in Sydney, stuck stuck in Australia at the moment, but uh, things are okay here. Kevin, I'm so glad to have you on the show. I've had the pleasure of interviewing you over the years about your past career as a visual effects supervisor, and may I also say VFX Oscar winner for What Dreams May Come. But in recent years, you've sort of dived into the world of well, what do you call it? I said virtual reality art, but what do you sort of describe it as or describe yourself as these days? Uh, I think virtual reality art is about as good as we've got at this point. Um, I think the the reality of it is, is really uh, virtual reality. But for so many, virtual reality means gaming or it means storytelling or it means uh, you know, education or healthcare or any number of things. And uh, for me, virtual reality is is definitely I look at it as a uh, as an artistic medium. Uh, that's my focus on it. Um, and I think that I think of it rather than making or emulating art from the real world or galleries and creating virtual galleries with virtual art that emulates traditional art uh, I'm more interested in, in exploring virtual reality as a medium in and of itself so that reality is the medium so that you're creating reality as an art form yeah I I can't wait to get into some of your creations and installations in fact one of the new ones has been accepted at the Venice International Film Festival, but we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm really curious about that intersection of computer graphics and visual effects work in your art. How did that even happen? What what made you switch to that and what made you realize you could do some cool stuff? Well, I was a, a traditional artist. I went to art school. I, I grew up, you know, my parents were Disney artists. so. I grew up uh, really immersed in art of all kinds, and in particular, art that used technology, so film and animation technology. Um, I, that was just what I grew up with. So I grew up with animating and drawing and painting and sculpting and doing play animation and, and all of that. And when I got to college, I, I, I went initially for illustration and then I found out that you know that the you know the album cover jobs and the science fiction book cover jobs were pretty rare <laughs> and that most people most illustrators you know mostly uh, illustrated patio furniture catalogs and so on so I switched I realized what I really wanted to do was fine art uh, so I switched my major but I really wanted to do animated films and so I made a lot of films and I kind of managed to uh, cut through some red tape there at the college and I got to do a lot of uh, films, which I turned in for, you know, a lot of classes. And so it was, it was kind of, uh, I got really into the fine art thing, abstract painting, photorealistic painting, uh, all manner of, of art. Uh, in the, I'd say, I, then I was working in the film industry starting in the uh, 80s and doing miniatures, matte painting, storyboards, concept art, stop motion animation, really any any art jobs I could find, scenic painting and so on. And then uh, in the, uh, it was about 1986, I was into it for a number of years before, but it took until 1986 for me able to get a computer because I'd been wanting to do computer graphics for a very long time for my fine art. Hmm. And I started exploring that for art and for music as well. And I, I just, I was, I was so excited about it because I had always wanted to do virtual reality. I'd had this 
concept from when I was a very small child, uh, seeing animated films and the, the, the theme park attractions at Disneyland where the film would be projected 360 degrees and so on. And I, I really wanted to do some advanced form of that. And I used to make drawings of crazy bubble helmets with myriad projectors and speakers all over them and so on. And uh, I saw computer graphics was gonna be the way that you would do that. And uh, of course, in 1986, I thought that virtual reality headsets would be right around the corner. <laughs> and uh, that turned out to not be the case. And I found myself kind of in the right place at the right time because I was doing computer graphics, but I was also working in traditional visual effects. And so I just, I got to help pioneer the use of computer graphics for visual effects. Hmm. And that was just a, you know, I caught a wave and, and wrote it uh, for many years, uh, getting to work on lots of cool movies and, and help develop the, the techniques and, and the tech drive the technology. Yeah, for people who don't know, Kevin worked on films like Fight Club and I mentioned What Dreams May Come, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, um, many others. Kevin, I've never asked you this, you were at Digital Domain for a while. Did did any kind of VR projects come across your desk at all, there or or elsewhere? I'm I'm always wondering whether you happen to have been able to work on a VR project or a film that had pretend VR sequences or anything like that. Um, no, I you know I was there for nine years mm. and I worked on um, uh. Terminator 2 3D, the mm -hmm. uh, attraction at uh, Universal, which had a 3D element and a big wide screen and live actors in front of it and so on. And that was uh, probably as close as it got. Uh, <laughs> I only worked on that for a little while, but um, no, I, I never got to, my, my exposure to VR really came through just what I would read, you know, in magazines and stuff. I called up uh, Jerome Lanier, uh, when, you know, in 1986 or whenever he was making news about his, his headset. And, uh, I called him up and, and said, Hey, can I get one of those headsets and can I make art with that? And, and he was very, very kind and then patient and asked me what I wanted to do with it. And I told him and he said, yeah, I think it might be a, you know, a while before that's really uh, feasible with the technology mm -hmm. we have. And uh, the headsets are still very costly and I can't afford to give you one. <laughs> but uh, then I got, uh, I would see it at SIGGRAPH uh, mm. every so often. I would go to any demo where they were showing VR and it was always just um, incredibly disappointing in the, in the quality of it, but it was also so exciting. I just, I could see its potential and, and uh, so I, I was very, very eager for that technology to to uh, become you know viable enough to create the kinds of things i wanted to do yeah and that became possible in like uh you know 2014 i got one of the prototype headsets and started fooling around and and dropped out of visual effects and i've been uh you know deep in it since then <laughs> well just to jump forward a bit I wanted to give some context to the kind of things you're doing because Kevin, I have to admit, I am obsessed with the VR art that you're doing and it's for two reasons. No, maybe three reasons. So here's the first reason. I feel like you're using procedural techniques and I think you still might use Houdini, but we can get into that yes. to do some of this stuff, which, which is a really nice VFX crossover. So that's one reason. The second reason is, I've experienced some of these things you've made, including at your house <laughs> a few mm -hmm. years ago. And my own experience with VR is that I tend to get sick, you know, um, seasick mm -hmm. inside a VR headset. Sure. It's, just a, it's just a thing. This did not happen with your experiences. I think I saw what you made was called Zen Parade or Blortasia or possibly both. Both, both. Yeah, you yeah. saw both of them. And... Honestly, I was in a different world for 20 minutes while I was looking at those. It's the imagery, it's the sound, it's the immersion. It's hard to communicate to listeners how good these were. But that's so that's the second reason. The third reason is 
Yeah, VR, you kind of think of games or some sort of, you know, walking through a house sort of experience. Yours, I just don't know if there's anything else out there like it. So tell, share with people, if you will, what Zen Parade and Blortasia were or are and how you made them. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, go to the show notes, everybody, and, and check out the trailers for those. You won't necessarily be able to see them in VR but you should get an idea about what they are from the, those notes. But Kevin, tell me about getting to that stage of Zen Parade and Blortasia. Well, Zen Parade was um, kind of a um, the first release or the first real finished product. I made an earlier version of it, but uh, it was short and I wanted to do it at higher res and so on. So Zen Parade was kind of my first real piece. And it was a 360 video. Mm. Um, I had not really explored real time much uh, at that time. So I just thought, well, I'll, I'll render a 360 video. Plus uh, the device at that time, the um, uh, Gear VR mm. by Samsung was, was kind of the thing that everybody was, it made it so it was portable. It was a really great, great way to work. So uh, that was a 360 video. It took a long time to render. Intel helped me with the rendering. Uh, and it's, you know, it's shapes in space. It's you just float through these shapes. Blortasia uh, was my first effort with uh, real time. So uh, I got into Unity and just started exploring and, and built this world with uh, all these shapes and sculptures. And, and there you're able to fly. What I found with, with real time, the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to be able to fly. This has been my dream since I was a little <laughs> kid. And I, you know, I was determined to fly. And when I started reading through all the best practices from Oculus and, and Google and so on, uh, they were all, all the experts were saying, uh, you need to use this uh, teleportation uh, movement uh, system. Uh, or snap turns or put a cockpit around people or create tunnel vision. They had a very a variety of ways to try to get around the motion sickness. And I just thought that that doesn't seem right to me. And I was determined to fly. So I just, you know, I have a background in neuroscience. So I decided to look at the vestibular system very closely and read all the papers on and theories on motion sickness. And I realized uh, when considering uh, motion sickness from, or the vestibular system from a um, evolutionary biology point of view, mm. uh, that it really was not the acceleration and deceleration. What, that was not the main problem. The big one was rotation. Uh, and so by... I designed a system where I, I made sure I never rotated the world virtually. So the, and the Vive made this possible because it was 360 tracking. And mm -hmm. so you could turn yourself around and you never had to rotate the world virtually. And that's really, I think the, the main culprit in, in motion sickness in VR. Now, of course, if you accelerate too quickly or decelerate too quickly, uh, that also uh, creates some, you know, um, issues for your the other part of your vestibular system, the otolithic bones. Uh, but, but the semicircular canals are much more sensitive and much more crucial because, uh, you know, if you're a little off in your rotational orientation, um, you're probably going to fall down and hit your head. Mm. And so, your, you know, your body kicks in and says, uh, lay down and makes you very sick so that you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll be safe. Um, I think the, the thing I found was that if you provided the mass and inertia that is expected for acceleration and deceleration, and you didn't overdo it with um, abruptness to it. You allow some coasting, some acceleration time and, and deceleration time that uh, it was just, it was your, your vestibular system was willing to work with you, especially if you never messed with the rotational element. And so that's what's what I found. And it just, it just worked. 
And I just, I still am in a kind of astounded that the, the industry in general tends to go in this other direction of um, these sudden things like they, they, they're so desperate to avoid the acceleration and deceleration that they just something much worse, which is just this instantaneous movement where you, mm. you, you push the trigger and now you're going, you know, five miles an hour or 10 miles an hour, whatever it is. And then when you let go, you just instantly stop. And likewise, when you do the, the turns, it's the same thing. It kind of, you just, or if you teleport, you just, there's this discontinuity in spatial awareness that our, our nervous system has no way to deal with that at all. Mm. And I, I'm convinced that discontinuities in that are uh, not a good idea for the vestibular system. I think they're very, very hard on the vestibular system. Yeah. Oh, I love the explanation about why I'm not feeling motion sick. That That's so good. Then, then Kevin, the imagery... Houdini just feels so well suited to this psychedelic but continually moving imagery that you have in these experiences. Um, you kind of had a long history with using that tool, don't you? Yes. Yeah, I was actually um, one of their first users. I believe uh, their first, I worked for a company that was their first seat in los angeles mm. and this was before visual effects in were went digital in movies uh there the software was primarily used for you know uh broadcast graphics and whatnot mm. and so i was working there uh, at this company commotion and they they had prisms mm -hmm. and i'd been working just doing my own art on an amiga and an atari and they saw, I went to them to transfer some of my work to video. And they said, well, this is pretty good work. If you want to come in and learn our software, we think we could, you know, put you to work. So I went in during their Christmas break or whatever, and tried to learn what was then prisms, what became Houdini. Hmm. And, um, and it was really great because they were a pretty small company at the time. And of course, I was very uh, a, a complete novice uh, about computer graphics. Uh, I was a traditionally trained artist and really knew very little about computers, except what I'd managed to figure out working with the Amiga and the Atari. And they, uh, it was odd because I would call tech support just constantly. And I was very fortunate because the owners of the company, the founders of, of Side Effects, uh, Kim Davidson and and mm -hmm. uh, really the Mark Lent, their head programmer and so on. They uh, they taught me computer graphics, just all the fundamentals. I'd be like, hey, uh, uh, what's what, what's a normal? You know what what you call these? What are, what is that? And just you know real beginner stuff. But they were so patient and kind, and so I really learned computer graphics from the creators of Houdini. Mm. So how do you use Houdini to create this imagery inside your VR experiences? I use Houdini primarily in the uh, modeling of the assets, the creation of the assets. And they are, uh, you know, very procedurally generated, although I'm really focused on a process of uh, hybridization of means in that I, I, I try to steer clear of being a purist about any particular method. So I've always built, well, not always, but uh, in, you know, over the last several years, I've focused on making my pipeline flexible so that uh, I can use a very procedural approach uh, and then rule-based systems and so on but then I can enter in and I can modify and direct that process at various levels all the way down to just going in and hand modeling things, doing hand, handmade things. I also like to sculpt volumetrically with, uh, you know, 3D code or whatever. And sometimes I'll take uh, sculptures I've made volumetrically by hand and then apply procedural uh, processes to them. So it goes, I find I go backwards and forwards. And ultimately over the years, I've found that my 
the things I make by hand look very much like the things I make procedurally, which look very much like the things <laughs> I make by hand. And really, if you look at my work from the, you know, from the early eighties, from college, even from my youth, uh, it's, there's a pretty consistent sort of style of imagery and forms and shapes that was there before I even got into computer graphics. Mm. And it just happened that computer graphics really lends itself to the kinds of things I'm interested in. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about your new creation, which is called Anandala. And that's been accepted into the Venice International Film Festival, which is amazing, Kevin. Congratulations. You must have been Thank really you. happy about that. Yes, I'm, I'm real excited about it. It's really cool. Uh, the, the film festival is you know, part of the Venice Biennale which uh, is, you know, this prestigious thing that's been around for, for a long, long time. And they, you know, this isn't the, uh, the art. They have, a, you know, an art biennale as well and an architecture one and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm just thrilled to be, be part of that whole process. Yeah. So for people who might not be able to actually experience Anandala right now, can you describe what happens in it? Yes, uh, you're transported to another reality. Uh, it's a vast, uh, otherworldly, abstract labyrinth that you explore. You can go in and inside and outside of it. It's very complex and organic. Uh, it's always evolving and changing in terms of the colors and the textures. Uh, it's topologically consistent. It it, there's a logic to it. There's no dead ends. It's it's sort of um, all connected. It's the form of it is a, a five dimensional icosahedron. So it's uh, it's essentially uh, three nested icosahedrons, one inside the other, uh, with all of their nodes connected, so that you can go from you know one to the next to the next and. And so it creates this wonderful maze. And of course, it's all very warped and, and organic. So it's easy to get lost, but uh, you, you always find your way because there are no dead ends. Anyway, you explore this space and within the space are uh, these creatures, which are artificial life called blorts. And they are basically living artworks they're abstract works of art but they're kind of uh they're not really uh deliberately anthropomorphized but they do have you know they make shapes and they they seem to be living things uh they really are a form of artificial life they have their own language they're expressive and creative uh very curious and friendly uh they have their own um you know sort of musical language and they change their shapes and colors to express themselves. They're aware of themselves and of others. So uh, yeah, you go and you interact with them and you can explore a vast space. There's a 130, each one is very unique with its own um, morphology and personality and so on. And uh, then there's you know various other, there's a, a kind of a shrine if you can find it there's portals placed throughout the space uh, about a dozen of them which will take you to different areas of the labyrinth but then and of course you're free to just explore freely but then there's one portal uh, where if you pass through this special portal it takes you beyond the labyrinth to the uh, sky shrine of sacred shapes uh, where you can meet the five uh, high priests of the sacred shapes and and hear them chanting. And then you can also uh, commune with the five uh, uh, gigantic colossal blort deities. Wow. Kevin, <laughs> it sounds just like what everyone needs to get their head away from the pandemic. <laughs> yes. Like, is, did well, that have anything is, to do um, with it? <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I started it well before the pandemic and as i said before these are ideas i've been working on my whole life mm. so there's a you know i wouldn't say it's really a response to that but it is kind of an appropriate uh, tonic in a sense mm. and and that's been i think a, a theme in my work from the beginning which was 
you know, which has probably kept me, uh, you know, out of the uh, high end fine arts scene. Uh, so much of the conceptual work and the work you see in galleries and museums is dealing with, uh, you know, really overtly dealing with current events and issues, mm -hmm. challenges, the crises in the world and so on. And I've always just kind of wanted to, you know, I'm well aware of these things and, and would love to be able to help uh, solve them. But um, making people more aware of how horrible things are never struck me as a very constructive thing for me to do personally. And I saw my, my uh, efforts better spent uh, towards providing a, even a momentary uh, refuge from that with the idea of being able to produce awe in people, to be mm. able to stimulate a, a, the emotion of awe and, and hopefully provide a, a transcendent experience of awe. I think that's really what drives my work. I have a, a, um, a, a um, very um, uh, small tolerance that is, I break down very easily into a state of awe, I suppose, uh, or as it's more commonly referred to, I'm easily amused. Um, so I, I, I just, I, I find so much beauty in the world and in nature and in art. And I've always wanted to be able to share that and also just from my own visions, my own dreams and imagination, wanted to be able to share that with people, uh, that, that experience of awe. And so that's, I think that is the primary driver behind my work. And in a sense, it is a comment on the state of the world of, you know, like complete <laughs> escapism. Yeah. Uh, I, I think has a, it has a role. I think it allows us to kind of regroup. Awe has this amazing ability it's it's you know it's really physically and and psychologically beneficial but uh it it seems to induce a process known as accommodation hmm. and accommodation is when we see something that generates awe it essentially it exceeds our model of reality our ideas our mental schema for a reality in our place within within reality and so it it inspires this accommodation, which is taking this new experience and integrating it with what we do know and altering and shifting and adjusting our mental scheme or our model of reality and of ourselves in a new way. And so it really allows for actual uh, lasting changes to personality and attitude and, and so on. So that's that's the sort of the grand goal behind I think all of my work. Well, I I think that's such a great goal. Um, and geez, Kevin, I really hope I can see this soon somehow. In fact, how can people see Anandala? Well, for the next uh, starting tomorrow through the nineteenth, it will be available through Viveport hmm. to Infinity subscribers and to uh, credentialed uh, you know, people going to the Venice uh, Film Festival. So if you, if you, you know, buy a ticket for the Venice Film Festival, then you'll be able to view uh, all of the materials through Viveport. Uh, it will also be in 14 different venues around the world. So in addition to the, in Venice at the Biennale, on the Lido, it will be available uh, in a number of uh, different countries, 10 different countries, uh, which are all listed on the, the uh, Biennale website, which I, I'll give you links to all of that. Awesome. And, and Kevin, I guess just turning to the future a little bit, uh, I have to say with VR, I love that you're doing it. I love seeing what else is out there. VR sometimes goes through a few kind of like, oh, is it, did it become everything people wanted it to be? Is there more to it? Um, is there less to it? You know, where, where are you right. at with VR? Obviously, you're a user and a creator for that medium, if we can call it that. But do you have any views on, on what VR should still become or could become? Or are we in a good place in terms of VR experiences? 
I don't think uh, most people have figured out uh, or been able to get their head around uh, the implications of virtual reality. I don't mm. think even the, you know, the big proponents, the companies, you know, spending billions to make it happen. I don't think they get it. Uh, I, I think they think of it as a, as an extension to gaming mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, uh, filmmakers, storytellers think of it as an extension to filmmaking. Uh, educators think of it as a, as a, an extension to, you know, training and teaching. Uh, but nobody's viewing it as a medium in and of itself. And I think it's much more akin. I think we have to think of it as virtual reality. It's not virtual gaming. It's not virtual storytelling. It's virtual reality. And of course you can do all those things, but you can do them in reality. But when you think of it, when you expand the, the concept of virtual reality as these are new realities, it's, it's very difficult for people because humanity has never known anything but one reality. Hmm. Um, and, our, you know, of course, you can argue that everyone has their own reality, but nonetheless, we have this sort of agreement that there is a consensual reality, singular consensual reality, an objective reality. And... I think VR, you know, we don't have language for it. We have no way to really, you know, explain it to each other or, or what it is. But for me, it's much more akin to like going into my work. I, I would compare it more to going on a scuba diving expedition or to, uh, you know, exploring some awe-inspiring natural environment uh, much more than like watching a movie or playing a game. I think it's, it's more, it, the fundamental innovation of virtual reality is spatial presence or the sense of being in a place. And that's a very powerful thing. And of course, you know, that can be used as an enhancement to a, a game or a story, but it because it's a very minor enhancement because if you're in deeply engaged in a story or a game, your brain is actually, um, it's inhibiting your spatial presence, except where it's relevant to that, the task at hand, the mm. story or the game. Mm. So it's, I think it's a very different medium that people haven't figured out yet. Mm. And I'm excited for when people, you know, finally get it and, I, in my, I, I demoed my work for thousands of people around the world for a few years. And the thing I found that was kind of amazing, uh, you know, people of all ages, all walks of life, everybody's really loves it and everything. Uh, the least, um, I guess, direct audience or the least likely audience are gamers. Mm. They've been playing video games for years. They they know about computer graphics and they don't value computer graphics the way other people do because in the game world, you know, gameplay is everything. Graphics are second. Mm. They've they've grown up with this indoctrination that, you know, in from the eight bit days, it was like this is the greatest game in the world, and yet look, it's only three hundred pixels across. Doesn't matter. It's the gameplay that matters. Mm. And of course, the graphics, of course, be have become tremendous for games now, but they're still really secondary to the gameplay. Hmm. That's why I think that people who are not gamers um, seem to be the most into it. I think they're the greatest audience for virtual reality there is. And of course, that includes lots of gamers, too. You know, it's like there's all kinds of people and in, in between. But I think, um, yeah, I think they're kind of missing the mark by marketing really focused on gamers when I think it's the, the people who are more interested in experience who would rather go to the Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon than, you know, play a game. Uh, I think that's their audience. Mm. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, with that in mind, are you already working on your next experience, Kevin? Is it... Is there something uh, we could tease or is it a few years away, do you think? 
Yeah, I'm I'm still percolating it. I definitely have ideas and and, and things I want to pursue, but uh, my thing has always been uh, having way too many ideas, and uh, and so I have to kind of let them sort out and figure out what I'm doing. Also, I don't um, usually I, I do occasionally, but generally, I don't have a plan. I prefer to discover my work. Mm -hmm. I go in search, I go and experiment and explore and, and discover realities that I never could have imagined. And, uh, you know, they, I might guide them and direct them and channel them and all of these things, but really I'm kind of riding a flow to, to, uh, arrive at a destination that I, I, I can't predict. I never would have been able to predict on Andala with all of its artificial life and these creatures and everything. Uh, I, I set out to just kind of make a little higher res space to fly around in with some cool sculptures. And then I wanted to give them a little animation. And then pretty soon I'm like, well, I want them to move on their own and be unpredictable. And then, then it was like, well, why don't I just make them go ahead and make them alive? Mm. And there was a, there was kind of a breakthrough for me. I, I've been into artificial life since the, you know, the nineties and was really into it then. And of course the hallmarks of all of that are simulating uh, evolution and, uh, you know, struggle to survive a natural selection, uh, predator prey relationships, all of the hallmarks of, of life as we know it. And after a while it, that started to weigh on me, I didn't want to I thought, well, that's that's great, but that's a, that's so brutal. It's I, I want to create more of a, a utopian world. Um, so I thought I started looking at uh, the motivations of behavior in cognitive neuroscience, both computational and biological. And I found a really interesting thing that they had broken down uh, the motivations for behavior into two categories, intrinsic and extrinsic and the extrinsic motivations are the things that we do for some other goal so you know we 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 hunt and gather so that we can eat or we we build a shelter so we can get out of the the cold and the rain we work a dead-end job to pay the bills you know it goes it's it's a lot of behavior is motivated by these intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. Uh, or extrinsic motivations, intrinsic motivations are are different because there the motivation or the behavior is its own motivation. So uh, there's no uh, goal beyond the behavior. The behavior itself is the end goal. And the things that fall into that category were all the things I was interested in. Play, uh, creative expression, art, you know, any kind of expression, social interaction, curiosity, scientific exploration, uh, you know, all of these things seem like, well, those are the positive things. This other side is kind of dark. And I, I just want to uh, focus on intrinsically motivated uh, behavior. So that's what I did. And I built the, this behavior system for the creatures where uh, they are, they, you know, they don't have to struggle to survive. There's no suffering. There's no conflict. They don't compete in any way. They're only, they love to socialize and express themselves. And they're just, you know, hundred percent full-time artists. <laughs> they don't have to eat. They don't have to sleep. Uh, they're very, very simple creatures, but, uh, and that kind of relates to another aspect of it, which is I wanted to make life that was native to virtual reality kind of forget about the constraints of the physical world and just think about well what if life could just live in virtual reality what would what could it be hmm. fascinating kevin um it's been really exciting talking to you about your past work and your current stuff i i want to direct people to your website which is kevinmacart.com, which has um, examples of the experiences you've made. Also got a link to a really great um, virtual exhibit you'd made for the Museum of Other Realities. People will mm -hmm. love that, I think, if they check it out. Um, are you on social media or anything like that, Kevin? I always also like to direct people 
in case you're yes on I, I i don't post all that frequently but i try to keep uh, putting things up uh i'm kevin mac art uh on instagram and on twitter and on uh on facebook i i have a kevin mac art account but it doesn't i don't post to it much because it, mm -hmm. they suddenly viewed that as a company page or something so they expect you to advertise and i don't so nobody mm -hmm. sees it so i tend to just post to my personal account uh, which is kevin kevin mac awesome well please everybody check out those different sites and social media um, locations kevin such a pleasure to chat to you again thanks for taking the time thank you it's fun. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you later.